share one thing with you. Starting June 27th, that's a couple of weeks away, we're going to start our, our, sun, or our summer series. That's a tough one to say real fast. I'll say it slowly. Summer series. And uh, we're going to be looking at a book called God Has a Name. We're going to kind of, I'm going to take you through this book, God Has a Name. It's by John Mark Comer. It's really powerful. We're going to look at the name of God that's in Genesis 34 and, and just see who God is as he's described himself in the scriptures. And so get ready for that. It's, it's, it's powerful. I mean, trust me, you don't want to miss this. You want to you see what God's going to do there. And so that'll be starting soon because we have this week and next week to finish up the series that we are in right now, going through the life of Joseph. And... If you have your Bibles, would you just turn with me to Genesis 46? Uh, we'll be at the end there of Genesis 46, and we'll dig into a little bit of Genesis 47. But the story is told of a husband who came down to breakfast one morning, and he was so delighted to hear his wife say to him, Darling, you are a model husband. And he was so encouraged by those words that it just gave him, you know, he was like on high all morning, like everything was going so well, everything was great, just those words, darling, you are a model husband. And so at lunchtime, he decided that he was going to look up that word. What does model mean? And so he found that word in the dictionary, and as he began to read the description, his mood began to change instantly, because the description of model is a small plastic imitation of the real thing. And it turned him away from being a model husband, you know, he didn't like that. But that's one definition of model, and that's not the only definition of model. The word model actually has several meanings, including someone who is exemplary, commendable, admirable, and excellent. And in that sense of the word model, we see Joseph. That's who Joseph is. It's a description of him as, as he's become this leader where we are now in, in Genesis. And there are these traits and characteristics that we should take note of as we look at Joseph's life because they are so good. We, feel, we see that Joseph, he was an authentic, genuine leader as he led the people as second in command of all of Egypt. And in him, we see a bunch of great qualities. And there's qualities there that each one of us would be, would be very good for us to grab a hold of and to place into our lives and to work toward those things. And if you remember, we last left Joseph off last Sunday. He revealed finally to his brothers that I am your brother Joseph who you sold into slavery. And then he sends them back, his brothers to his and their father, all of their father there, with the best of all that Egypt had. And he, they, he says to his brothers, when you get back, tell my, my father that I'm alive and tell him that he needs to move our family here to Egypt because the famine is not even close to being over and I want to take care of my family so come move down here and so when Joseph's brothers finally do make it home they tell their father all that's happened and that Joseph is still alive and believe it or not dad Joseph's second in command in Egypt and of course, on hearing that, Jacob, their father, really doesn't believe them. Like, that can't be. He's gone. He's dead. There's no way he could be even the second command of Egypt. And so then his sons show them all of the things that they brought back from Egypt, and he finally believes that his son is alive. And so Jacob decides then, and he loads up all of his family, and they start to head and toward Egypt to move there. But when Jacob gets to the border of Canaan where they're living, he stops. And there he builds an altar to God and he asks God, God, should I take our family from the land of Canaan and should we move down to Egypt? Now, during this series, we've said a lot of critical things about Jacob, and rightly so. But here, here is one time where we see Jacob finally getting it right. He's not going to leave the land that God had placed his family in unless God says, yes, it is time to go. This is where I am leading you. This is where I am taking you. 
And so he stops and he prays at this altar that he builds to God. And God comes to Jacob in the middle of the night and he tells him, I want you to go down to Egypt, take your family there, and at some point your family is going to move back to Canaan. Someday down the road. And so this is what he does. And this is where we pick up the story this morning. Jacob and his sons have returned now back to Egypt. They've made it to Egypt. I guess his sons have returned. Jacob's, this is his trip. And as his family comes to meet Joseph in Egypt, we see Joseph here. He lives a life of integrity in all of his life, in his job, in, in all of his life. And this is what we're going to notice this morning as we look at the life of Joseph. And integrity in every aspect of our lives is incredibly important to have this integrity. We need integrity in everything that we do and everywhere that we go. And integrity at the church and when we're here together is good. And integrity around other believers is good. We need that. But that is not the only place we should have integrity. We need integrity in all that we do. And I find it interesting that in the three series that we have been here at Chico First, when we went through the Sermon on the Mount and then we went through the book of James and now here in Joseph, we're seeing this in each one of those series. Integrity, integrity, integrity. And so what does integrity mean? Maybe you remember from that and maybe not. Let me help you just to remind you this morning what integrity is. But integrity comes from the word integer, which is a whole number. It's not fractured, but a whole. And God is wanting to make us whole. That's what he wants wants from us, to be a complete person, not fractured, but whole, right? It's where our lives back up what we say, and more importantly, back up what we believe through the Word of God. And so a person with integrity, then, is a person who is not divided. They're not pretending to be a certain way that they really aren't. A person with integrity is whole. A person who has nothing to hide and nothing to fear. A person with integrity doesn't try to love God and the, th the things of the world at the same time. And so wherever we spend, wherever you spend the most of your time, that is where you have to have integrity the most. Whatever that is, wherever. So whether that's your job, whether that's your family, whether that's in the community, whether that's something else, I don't know. Whatever, wherever you spend the most of your time, that's where you need to have integrity the most. You need to have it there. Because where we spend most of our time is where it's going to reveal our true character. It's just going to come out where we spend our most time. And so if we have integrity, it will be seen there where we spend our most time because of the pressures and stresses that we will have in those places, in those things, in our job place, whatever it may be. It will test us to see if we're willing to allow the Lord God to work all things in our lives and through our lives. Is he working in my life or is he not? And Joseph shows us here how to work and live with integrity in all things and in all we do. Just to be a whole person who puts God first in their life. Charles Swindoll talks about this. I'm going to read to you what he has to say. But he says, integrity keeps your personal life pure and straight regardless of the benefits and personal perks that might come your way through compromise. He says, integrity is tough stuff. Integrity does not take the easy way. Make the easy choices or choose the pleasures for a season path. Above all, integrity, he says, is what you are when there isn't anyone around to check up on you. It's best demonstrated when nobody's watching. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at this passage here and see Joseph and his life of integrity. So if you have your Bibles open to Genesis 46, we're going to start in verse 31, and let's read there. And it says, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keeping or keepers of the livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds 
birds and all they have. And when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of the livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So, we'll unpack this here in just a second, but how do we have integrity like Joseph did in his life and his work? And let's take a look at this. The first thing we notice here in this passage is, is that Joseph prepared for the future by looking at it realistically. That's the way to have integrity. We prepare for the future by looking at it realis realistically. Joseph, he had a lot of pressures and stresses in his life from what he was doing in his work. Like he's in the middle here of a seven year famine and he's in charge of all of this distributing of the food here for all the people. Everybody was coming to him for food. And so he had planned beforehand because God had prepared them for this through the dreams of Pharaoh and the interpretation that God brought through Joseph to prepare for the seven good years to get all the food ready for the seven bad years. And so he built all of these storehouses for the grain to store that during these famine years so that the people could be fed. And so he planned this, and he planned then how to distribute all of this food so that everyone had enough to eat so that no one would starve. Now, not only did he do this, but by this, he saved the, the nation of Egypt, and not only the nation of Egypt, but the surrounding nations. And his family, he was able to even save his family. They moved down, as we're reading here and seeing here, they've moved down to Egypt. And so now Joseph's got to find a place for them to live. This isn't just a small family. This is a big family. I mean, he's got 11 brothers, and they're all uh, middle-aged at this point where they've got their own children. So this is a pretty big family that they've got to find place for. And even though Joseph was the second in command of all of Egypt, he didn't think that he was superior to Pharaoh. He didn't even think that he could just say, hey, you know, you guys go find the best place and we're going to set you up there and everything's going to be good. He didn't do that. And so what he did was he planned out the best way to get his family a place to live. And so he talked to his family, how, how can we talk to Pharaoh to do this? And so Joseph tells his brothers what not to say when they talk to Pharaoh about their work. He told them, you know what, I want you to tell the truth, tell him exactly what you do, but do it in a way that's not going to offend Pharaoh when you tell him. Because for some reason, being a shepherd was detestable to the Egyptian people. And so Joseph knew this, and he knew that the Egyptian people, and so he, he told them, this is what I want you to say to Pharaoh so that you won't offend him. You're going to tell him you're shepherds, but say in a way that won't offend him. And so he prepared his family family for success by doing this. And Joseph saw the truth. He was ready to live in the truth. That's integrity right there, all right? As opposed to, to living in what he wanted to be the truth, all right? He lived in what was really the truth and as opposed to what he really wanted to be the truth. He didn't practice any self-deception. He didn't lie. And this is how we have to live our lives as people of integrity as God has called us to. Integrity prepares us for the future by looking at it realistically and integrity does not deceive others. It does not lie or try to trick other people. Let's read a little bit more. Go to chapter 47 now, verse 1. Genesis 47, verse 1 says, So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. 
The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their sojourning. <laughs> Tongue twister. Verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And then, Fa and then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, and the land of Ramses as Pharaoh had commanded. The second thing we see about integrity here is, is Joseph submitted to authority. See, Joseph went to Pharaoh, and he tells his family, he tells them that his family have survived and, and, and how they got to this point here to live here, and that they've brought all of their livestock, all of their animals down, and he tells them that they, they need a place for their family and all of their animals. And he brings five of his 11 brothers before Pharaoh and introduces them to him as the representatives of the family. And here we see Joseph, he's submitting to his boss and his leader of the you know, with when it comes to his family, right? And with that, he honors Pharaoh and does not assume that he can just put his family any place he wants or put them in the best spot without making sure that's okay, getting Pharaoh's approval. And even with his own family, he does his job with integrity. And after Pharaoh talks to his brothers that are there, he then meets Jacob, the father of this family, and he tells them, you know what, you can move into this land of Goshen, and this is what Joseph does. He submits himself to the leadership there and does what he's told to do. And he moves his family then into this land there, that Goshen land, and they tend to their animals, their flocks. And see, for all of us, in some sort of capacity, we serve under someone's authority. And let me ask you this morning, how is your attitude to that leader? How do you look at that person? See, our attitude to the leader that we have in our lives, even if that leader is not a good leader, it shows the integrity and the maturity that we have in the Lord God Almighty and our, or the lack thereof, depending on how we, what our attitude is. And so in Joseph, though, we see that he is loyal, he's accountable, he's wise, he's objective, he's even efficient in his work for his leader. And we need to be the same with the leaders that God has placed us under. Let's read some more. Verse 13. It says, Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they had bought. And Joseph bought all the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? for our money is now gone. And the third thing we see here is how do we have integrity like Joseph? Well, we see that third, he provided. Joseph provided for the people with personal integrity. All of the people in Egypt and Canaan came to buy food from him because of this, this terrible famine. Now think about this for, the, for a moment. Can you imagine the power that Joseph had because he is in charge of all of the food that is in this land? He's the only one. He's in charge of it. He could do whatever he wanted with all of this food. Like if he didn't like you, he could let you starve to death. If he really liked you, he could make you feast forever. If you had the right amount of money, right? Like he's got the monopoly on this thing. He could do whatever he wanted. There wasn't any competition because this was the only food. And so Joseph here, he has all of the lives of the people in this land in his hand. And with this much control, he could, like I said, he could do anything for his own gain. 
he could even charge tons of it, money, and keep some of it for himself, make himself rich in this, and give the rest to Pharaoh. But as we saw here, and we read here, do you see what he did? He did not keep any of the money of the food. He gave it all back to Pharaoh, right? And everything that he did, he worked with complete integrity because... And because of that, this brought about the survival of Egypt and all of the surrounding nations, the people around them. And the people came to Joseph then with nothing. They're out of money, they're out of food, and they need food or they're going to die in this famine. And Joseph responds to the people who have nothing. They can't do anything for him. They can't even buy food anymore. And he treats these people with respect. He treats them kindly. And we notice here that Joseph had everything and the people now now have nothing, and all of the people are at Joseph's mercy. So what happens? Verse 16, and it says, And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock, if your money is gone. And so they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of our livestock are my Lord's, and there is nothing left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. And so Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields, because the famine was so severe on them, and the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made them servants of them from one end of Egypt to another, only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. And then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh. A four-fifth shall be your own as seed for the field and as for you, as food for yourselves and your households and as food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statue concerning the land of Egypt and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth and the land of the priest alone did not become Pharaoh's. A lot there. But Joseph, what he had to do was he had to devise up two separate plans during the famine so that the people would not starve and that they could pay for the food. In the midst of all of these events, Joseph never abused the power that he had. See, God had raised him up from slavery when his brothers had sold him into slavery, right? And God had brought him from that and even from the dungeon prison that he'd been in for more than two years. And God had taken him from that and he brought him to the second in command of Egypt. And because of that, he was willing to give God all the glory and live for God with his life. God had done all these great things in his life. And so he came up with a plan that was really fair to everyone involved. And the people were eager to listen to Joseph about this plan because they knew that they could trust him. They'd seen his integrity in other things, so they knew that they could trust him. And that's what Joseph did. He treated every situation with integrity. It's how he lived his life. And you may say, well, okay, that's great for Joseph, but what does that mean for me? How do I live my life this way, or do, should I live my life this way? Let me tell you, a person of integrity is validated by their words and their performance, how they live their lives. And so if you are pure in heart, you can also, that will translate to being pure in your actions and the things that you do. And so integrity, what it is, it's daily making actions and choices that line up with the Word of God, the Bible. That's integrity. And so how do we live successfully these lives of integrity? Well, first thing we see here is we must value the benefits of integrity. We've got to value this. Let's be realistic about this for a moment here. None of us are going to change unless we understand the value of that change, right? 
Not many of us are going to pay the price for something in a store unless we agree that that's a good price for it. That's the right price. That's worth the price. And so if I'm going to be a person of integrity in my life, I have to understand the value of integrity and determine that it's worth the price that I have to pay for integrity. Let me tell you what integrity does. Integrity protects us because we don't have to lie. We can tell the truth. We don't have to, you know, make something up. We can just live in that truth, and it protects us. Integrity actually guides us because when we do what is right, we have the standard of God to lead us, the Word of God. It leads us. And so we don't have to make things up. We don't have to try to, you know, do all these. We just trust God and His way, and His Word is truth, and we follow it. And so it guides us. It protects Texas. Integrity also gives us hope because one day we're going to stand before God and we know that we have lived our lives the way that we are not ashamed of because we trusted his word. We trusted him and what he has done for us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Second thing we see here is we have to allow the Bible to be our guide in everything. I mean, I've already kind of talked about this already here just a moment ago, but let's just say it, right? It, the Bible's got to be our guide for everything in life. The Bible is the truth. And if we don't live the truth of the Bible, we can't succeed in integrity. We might be a good person, we might do some good things, but we might miss it somewhere else. We need to live the truth of the Word of God. And once we turn from the truth, if we get away from the truth of the Word of God, what it does is it begins to slowly erode our character. It may not start bad initially, but it continues to just erode and get worse and worse. And then we begin to turn from integrity. And if we believe that the Bible is the perfect Word of God, which I believe it is, then how can we not look at it every day to be our guide in life? We need to look to the Word of God. And the third thing that we see here this morning is, is we have to guard our motives if we want to live lives of integrity. We need to watch how we respond and how we relate to the people around us, whether it's our, ch our church people, whether it's uh, work people, whether it's community people, wh wherever you are. Are we doing things, are we doing the right thing for the wrong reason? That's easy, right? Like we know it's the right thing, but we just don't really want to do it or we're doing it to gain something. When we do the right thing for the wrong reason, it's still not right, okay? Are we just trying to please people? And so we need to look at why we do what we do. Why are we doing these things? And if we are doing these things just because that's how we've always done these things, then we need to find out, is that really what we should be doing? We've got to take a look at this. Maybe we need to make a change in this. See, we look at the life of Joseph here in these just couple of chapters. Joseph adjusted and he changed and he was flexible throughout his life. He dealt with all of the many challenges that he faced and he never backed down from a challenge. He stood up to it. He walked through it. And so we have to ask ourselves, are our motives pure in what we are doing? Are our motives pure? And just like Joseph, God does the same thing with us as we see in his life. He deals with the hard questions of life for us. Not necessarily the question, how do I make a living? How do I, you know, succeed? But how do I really make life? How do I really live life the way I'm supposed to? How do I get along with God? How do I prepare for eternity? And see, when we answer the hard questions, when we do answer those the right way, all of those other questions begin to fall into place. And so let me just say this morning, let's, uh, let us be a people, let us be the church, and so let us be the models of diligence, of honesty, of compassion, even of creativity. We should be on the front of creativity. May our work be an extension of our integrity. May we be a light and be positive light and influence to everyone around us. May people, may people see Jesus in us. I truly see Jesus in the way we live our lives. See, integrity is a choice. And we have to allow the Bible to guide us 
so that we can live right and we can do what's godly. We do it with godly motives, right motives, that we can live a life of integrity in every single thing we do. And as I prepared this this week and as I was thinking about this, the, the scripture verse that came back over to me and it just came, ran through my mind over and over again was Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. It says, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Amen. See, integrity is about choices. It's choosing what's to choosing what to do what's right every single day, no matter what. Like I'm gonna make this choice to follow God and follow his word and do what is right. It's choosing what's godly every day. And we do that with the direction of the Word of God, the Bible, and with the power of the Spirit. We just can't just say, I'm going to make this choice. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be able to make these choices, okay? And so no matter what, like no matter even if it's, it's, it's going to benefit me to not live this life of integrity and to do what's right, i got to still make that choice to do what's right. It's honoring God, and I'll tell you what, it's what keeps us safe and secure. Doing what's right, integrity. And so as we are praying throughout the week and as we're reading in the Word of God throughout the week and, and hopefully we're studying the Word of God and seeing what that Word really says and how it applies to our lives. And if we see we're doing that, we see things in our lives that don't line up with the Word of God and that there needs to be a change in our lives, may we be willing to do that. May we be brave enough to do that in our lives. Say, God, I see as we're praying and he's, the Spirit leads us and we, yes, I need to make that change. Would you allow the, by the power of God's Spirit to help you make that change in your life? See, integrity, what it does is it leads us to change, to where God wants us to be. And we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we also do it through the love and the encouragement of the church. When we are together, we strengthen each other to live for Christ, to live lives of integrity. And so we need each other. Just as Ben was talking this morning. And so let me just ask you a couple of questions as we close here this morning. How are you living your life today? How are you living your life today? Are you doing everything as if doing it unto the Lord and for the Lord? Are you living your life with integrity in, in all aspects of your life? Really, are you being a whole person? And this is what God wants for us. This is what God wants to lead us to. And so as the musicians come right now, we're going to close with prayer. And as always, the altars are open. If you want to come and pray, you can come and pray. There's people up here that will pray with you. But if you see this morning that God is speaking into your life and he's saying, you know, the, right here, this area or this thing, he's saying you need to change. We just give that up to God this morning. So God, yes, I understand. I want to live my life with integrity. I want to live my life for you. I want, to ch I want the power of the Spirit to lead me in all things and the Word of God to be so powerful in my life. Will you just give that up to God this morning? Will you trust Him? There will be people up here that will be willing to pray with you this morning if you want them to pray. You can come on up. If you need prayer for anything else, come on up because God is here and He wants to meet you right where you are. He loves you. If you need healing, if you need provision, whatever it is, you're welcome to come. We'd love to pray with you. But let's worship Jesus this morning. He is what integrity all is. As we follow him, as we look to him, we live our lives as Jesus in the direction of the Spirit. We will live lives of integrity.